Welcome back to my channel. In this video, we're going to review the second part of CIO.com's list of 12 biggest issues faced facing CIOs and IT departments. I'll link to the first video in the description of this video. Um, and in this one, we're going to cover some pretty big topics. So I hope to provide some insight on how to address these topics and link to some supporting content as well. And talk about one topic that we'll just say I disagree with. So stay tuned. Hi, my name is Steve Murphy. I'm a vice president at ARG. And while I work for ARG, this video is my own and does not represent the views or opinions of my employer. This channel is dedicated to helping technology leaders make great business decisions. And as I said, CIO.com published a list of 12 IT and CIO priorities. I thought I'd summarize these priorities and provide some additional context and links to some of my previous videos that help explain how we can address these objectives. As I mentioned, this is the second part of the list, but the list is in no particular order, so feel free to look at part one, which is linked in the description of this video after you've watched this video. Let's jump into the priorities. The first CIO priority is to generate data insights. I know, we all struggle with this one. We have all this data acquired over the years, much of it unstructured, and your data probably resides in multiple data stores. Just auditing it to understand what you have is a Herculean task. One of the biggest problems I see is working through how to get information out of the data is that we don't know the questions we're asking. Frequently, the statement is made that we need to throw the data into an AI and see what it spits out. And we all know that this, uh, this approach is um, an uninformed ask. First, AI is not generally available for this type of let's see what pops out approach. And secondly, AI today is very insecure. So putting enough data into a platform to generate some, re some results is super dangerous without significant due diligence. Lastly, well, what you're likely to get might be entirely useless, random, and unactionable correlations. So a better strategy is to work with the business units and assess some of their larger questions. If we can get guidance on to which answers will move the business forward, we can then start to evaluate how to achieve a data-informed insight effort. Now, one, other, one of the other challenges with getting insight from data is that it's really not an IT process, right? IT keeps the data. IT protects the data, but data manipulation and analysis are not typically a core competency of the IT department. I don't think it's a bad idea for IT to push for the data analytics resource, but we need others to understand that your database admin is not going to be leading the charge in delivering insights. We might need other departments to step into the analytics role, or as I said, we can choose to expand IT and add the the resources necessary in our own departments, but that's a completely new discipline we might be stepping up to. So we just need to understand that it's, uh, it's gonna be a lift, probably a pretty heavy one, but if it's the only place in the organization where it uh, can live, so be it. I think IT's typically the most adaptable organization um, in a larger company. All right, next topic meeting regulatory requirements. This topic has been bumping around IT and risk management uh, or your general counsel's office for years now, but things have changed dramatically in the past five years. We have brand new regulatory frameworks that give our customers expansive rights over the data you are keeping on them. So um, it's not just a privacy uh, issue anymore it, that's getting regulatory attention but security and litigation are also hot topics that are circling in boardrooms. Similar to driving insights from data, conforming to regulatory protocols is not a longstanding IT function, but here are some ideas to get you started. The first, number one, appoint a leader um, for your data initiatives. Think of it as a data protection officer or something similar. This may be someone in a DBA role, if your organization is smaller, or it might be someone in a more senior position. This data leader will act as a liaison to the other organizations to understand, prioritize, and plan for compliance with various regulations. Number two is you have to map your data. Make a complete inventory of the known databases and have your data leader begin to seek out other areas where data might be kept. Number three, ensure that you have established strong access controls to the data and that it's encrypted. Preventing the 
exfiltration of usable data really is one of the main concerns of the, of the privacy regulations. Undertake data protection impact assessments is number four. This can sound like a daunting task, but I suggest starting modestly. Review the data inventory developed by your team and determine where you're storing personal identifying information or PII. This is the data most regulations are seeking to protect and to, and to control, actually regulate. Then you wanna work with your regulatory legal team to assess the exposure that different classes of data might present to your organization. You can now use this information to start prioritizing your more detailed data management plan. Number five, ensure that your organization has a data breach protocol. You should have a formal plan that lists specific actions and steps to take in the event of a data breach. For example, when do you isolate systems to prevent further spread or data compromise? Who was brought into the decision-making process and at what point, et cetera? Number six, make sure your cyber incident insurance is up to date and sufficient for the new regulatory framework. Again, insurance is not technically the job of the IT department, but your decisions in the moment will be influenced by your knowledge of the amount and limitations of your cyber insurance policy. So next topic, democratizing tech development. Let me just say this. This is a horrible idea, in my opinion. I admittedly don't understand the use cases of a lot, uh, that it's certain individuals or certain organizations have that might uh, indicate that allowing marketing or customer care to develop their own software is a good idea. I'm sure there are important benefits, but it's just such a horrible idea, I can't even speak about it. I hope what CIO Magazine means is that companies are expanding IT resources into operating units. That's something I'm totally on board with, but without that distinction, well, We'll just move on without any further comment. The next is acquiring and retaining talent. Now, I'm no HR expert, but I have done some videos on the value of using managed services providers to augment your talent pool. I'm a big believer in this strategy because you're not beholden to any particular person in your internal organization. The MSP should be documenting their work and you should have access to those documents should, the, should you and the MSP part ways. So you do have a uh, continuity plan inherent in your MSP relationship, or at least you should have one. Using MSPs to, to um, uh, using MSPs insulates you to a certain level from the risk of your internal resources leaving. Now let's talk about those internal resources for just a moment. IT staff are notorious for learning a new skill or getting a new certification and then sh going off and shopping the market. There's no magic wand to wave over your team and make them stay for the next five years. As a manager for the last 30 years, the best advice here is to be the best boss you've, uh, they've ever had. Be the person they will go through walls for, they will work late for, or they'll do anything for. If you get to be that type of boss, um, your team will show you a great deal of loyalty and just might stay a little bit longer than uh, on average. Let's talk about number five, I think out of the six, preparing IT teams for the future. Personally, I think there's one thing and just one thing an IT leader can do to prepare their team for the future. That one thing is creating a culture of learning. We don't know what the future will be. We don't know what systems will be running in the future, uh, but we do know that whatever we're going to be doing five years into the, uh, in, into the future, some of the team are gonna have to learn new skills. So to encourage a, a culture of learning, uh, cross-train relevant, uh, get, and encourage your team to take relevant certifications and make sure that your team has mentorship going on among the, the, the peers and among the uh, management levels. Yeah, there's always a risk that they'll take those new learnings out to the market, but we can't operate out of fear. Do what's right for your team and be happy knowing that you did your best, regardless of the outcome. The last item that CIO.com has in terms of needing prioritization in IT organizations is to create a hybrid work environment that works for everyone. And yes, in case you haven't heard the news, hybrid work is here to stay. Now that our systems are fully supportive, we need to make adjustments to our processes and culture to get the best out of both worlds. One of the first areas to consider is your new hire onboarding and mentoring process. 
working outside the office um, is very challenging for new hires. Consider uh, asking some of your younger staff to mentor new hires. And here I'm um, saying younger because I've just made the assumption that your hire would also be younger. But we want to try to match the age and the gender of the mentor to the new hire. Be clear, this is not about supervision. This, uh, this mentor relationship is about providing a network. People to whom the new hire can go to for how do I do this type of questions that they may not feel comfortable asking their boss. Since I'm talking about matching age and gender, you may want to check with HR to make sure you're not crossing any lines set by your organization. Um, it's just that, in my experience, people the same age and gender tend to bond more readily. But hey, things are less clear in this regard today, so maybe a quick conversation with AR is appropriate. Also, with regard to working from home, having days set aside for everyone to be in the office together so they can meet face-to-face, -face, talk, eat, joke, et cetera, is very effective. Most organizations are already doing it, um, but these days do need to include out-of-the-area team members as well. So if you don't have a travel budget for these meetings, it's time to start making that ask uh, from your management team. For local people, once a week is typical now. For out-of-towners, once a quarter would be great coming in. Um, but your organization, I'm sure, has, uh, has larger policies that you know, IT might need to be, uh, be compliant with. So wrapping up, just a reminder that the first part of this list is on my channel. I have a video link here and in the description of this video. If you have not seen part one and want the full effect of all the 12 initiatives from CIO.com's list, I encourage you to watch that other video. I realize this is a long list. You can't innovate and initiate everything on this list, but picking a few of the most pressing needs is something we should all strive for as technology leaders. Making progress in our organizations um, to elevate the status of the IT organization is one of the key accomplishments we can look back on with pride at the close of this year. Thanks very much for watching. And if you got some value out of this video, I'd appreciate a like, a thumbs up. And thanks very much again for doing that. And if you want to find your way back to this channel in the future, the best way of doing that is to subscribe. That will allow you to easily come back at your convenience. Once again, thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.